Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, Troy Morgan joins us from North Richland Hills, Texas, where he's founder and CEO of Pantech Design, a software development firm specializing in Crestron control systems for commercial and residential applications. Troy has 23 years of programming experience and has earned the distinction of Crestron Master Programmer. He founded Pantech Design in 2005 with the goal of elevating the quality of software and service for audio, video, and environmental automation. Under Troy's leadership, Pantech Design has become one of the top Crestron service provider firms in the industry and developed groundbreaking products such as the Adapt for Crestron software suite and Adapt Energy, a home energy automation ecosystem. Adapt Energy applies home automation concepts to energy management applications. Troy sees this as the next evolution to tackle the world's energy challenges now and into the future. Troy Morgan, welcome to the podcast. Pleasure, my friend. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. Well, as you know, because you uh, were kind enough to listen to it after the fact, on last week's podcast, we talked extensively to Blake Riquetta about his company, Sonnen, and energy storage tech in general. Your name came up during that conversation, so I felt like it would be an amazing thing if we could get you on the podcast right afterwards so that we could create a kind of companion episode to, to match up with that interview. And while doing my homework for this interview... I came to realize just how intertwined Blake Riquetta and Sonnen is to the creation of Adapt Energy. So I want to get to that story, but before we do, I want to establish your bona fides, if I, if I didn't already in the intro, to the Cedia channel. Um, how is it that you got started in the custom integration business in the first place? So custom integration in, in general, I... Um, I Program well, it came out of car audio actually. If I really, really go back, you know, back in the day, um, I built a lot of amazing, you know, car audio systems, and I was a, uh, I asked a sound judge, and I, you know, I was really heavy into it, and, and um, I, I, honestly, I got tired of crawling under dashboards, man. To be, <laughs> be blunt, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to work on something that was a little bigger than a car. And so I started looking around at, you know, where people were doing really cool stuff in homes and whatnot. And back then, and so this is like 94, there wasn't a whole lot happening um, in that space, but the commercial space, there was mm -hmm. a lot, you know, happening there. So I went to work for a commercial integrator and um, uh, got thrown into having to program a Crestron system in 1997. My boss had left and the big boss said, can you do this? And I went, I don't know. And that is literally how all of this started, because okay. um, had I not had that opportunity, who knows what I'd be doing today. But um, yeah, and then that just spun into I went to work for Crestron. I started their Dallas office, um, worked directly under Randy Klein and, and the late Fred Bargatze um, for my, my period of time with them. And uh, the next natural progression with Crestron was to move to New Jersey. And I just I didn't want to do that. I like okay. Texas. So yeah. Uh, that was when I left Crestron and, and started Pantech Design. Yeah, and and so if I can kind of just re read what you say in your history of the company, you needed you wanted to elevate the standard of quality and custom integration with Pantech Design, and so you launched in two thousand and five, if I'm correct. Um, what was the the idea there to just to do programming, uh, outsource programming for integrators? Yes and no. Um, what we, what I realized when I was with Crestron was the, the lack of um, planning that went into a lot of these large scale um, automation systems. And I felt like we could add a lot of value as a company, not only as a software uh, uh, firm, but also as a design and engineering firm. And, and that's really what, what we spent time building was a process that an integrator could um, sort of jump into no matter what stage of the game they were in. And we would be able to sort of, you know, spoon feed them through it in, in, in a way that it was easy for them. It was, uh, you know, nice and smooth for us. And it, it made good business relationships because of it. And so that was, that was what we did. Um, so every job we did has a detailed scope, set of AutoCAD drawings, 
and of course the software, you know, to go to go with it. And as long as they follow the, the plan, um, you you could be successful. And and that was really the that was the goal we set out to achieve. And and I believe we we did that. Um, it, uh, it it started to really flourish in say 2007, 2008, and then you know we had a little bit of a a dip from the the housing thing and. And then it picked back up and ran like crazy. And, you know, I guess the rest is history, as they say. And now when you have the new um, hardware from Crest, John, come out in 2012 and the new code language, mm-hmm. how does that change things? Because it seems like in your mm-hmm. timeline, that's a big deal for, for your company. That's a game changer. Uh, wow, Jeremy, you 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 continually impress. Uh, how, how, I don't even know where you found that. Um so, uh, yeah, a really cool thing happened. A uh, girl, a lady by the name of Betsy Longendorfer, you may know that name. Um, she was responsible for a lot of the software tools and things at Crestron for many, many years. Simple Windows and VT Pro and some of these tools that, that we use. She came to us and, and showed us um, a new thing they were working on. It was in its alpha stages, and it was called Simple Sharp. And for the first time, Myself and my team, we, we, we looked at this and we went all like, this is all the things that we've been missing in terms of a, uh, a more powerful programming language where we could do a lot of cool stuff behind the scenes. That spun into um, us developing a whole new way to program Crestron systems. Um, the whole uh, idea there was it was going to be a tool that we used internally, right? And, and that we uh just you know did our stuff we made it faster better uh we could be um more competitive i think and uh and then a really great thing happened after that after we got all that stuff developed um uh, fred came to me and said hey man you really need to make this available to everybody this is this is killer um what can i do to help you know and it was like wow never thought about that um Actually, I'll give you a Fredism because I love him dearly and, and, and I attribute a lot of where I am to him um, and miss him. But uh, when he was asking me about that, he said, um, uh, you know, would you consider making this available to all the programs? And I said, uh, Fred, you're asking me to give away the keys to the kingdom here. Mm. And in the most beautiful, crafty Fred way, Nice and calm and cool, too. He says, no, I'm asking you to create a new kingdom. Mm. It was like, wow. And so I took that to the team, and that's when Adapt was born, as far as a brand goes anyway. Yeah, and so that becomes basically a programming tool for Crestron dealers then at that point? Yeah, that's right. It is. It is, and and to this day, I, I can I believe I can still say these words. Um, it is the fastest, most flexible, and powerful way to program a Crestron residential system. Crestron Home is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I love it, and and it's a, even a little bit of a competing thing to what what we develop. But they are two very very different uh, things that serve, in my opinion, two very different purposes. And uh, so it it. I mean, adapt is true to its name. The whole, in fact, that's why that R two D two back there was even built. That mm-hmm. was built to prove to the industry that I don't care what the device is that you need to control. Our adapt software can do it. Okay. So when we introduced adapt in Cedia twenty fifteen, he was on the show floor with me, and I built that thing from the ground up, literally for that purpose. Right. So here's an adapt device that is the most odd adapt device you could ever imagine <laughs> but our software controls it beautifully so. well i i would love to talk about how crestron home is different but i think that that gets us off track a little bit so we'll I, I would like to just connect the dots to adapt um the dealer program with adapt energy now because you're really cool stuff right now that i obviously led from last week's conversation into this one is is getting into renewable energy and what was it that grabbed you what what was it that you decided is the reason why you need to do this energy thing is it was it happening 
was it coming up in conversations with dealers that they were trying to figure out a way to make these things work together in a smart home no, and you created a solution or not, not, not when I started. Um, but so, so I'll tell you some of the history. Um, I, I, I started monitoring energy in my home in 2012. Uh, Crestron has this like, you know, really cool energy monitoring thing that they've been trying to, you know, put out there into the commercial space for a long, long time. And, and I took that and, and I put it in my house and, you know, I mo monitored energy in my home for years. Um, here's what I learned, though, doing that. Um, I use a lot more power than the average consumer because <laughs> I got all these crazy uh, electronic devices. Right. Um, I knew when we were doing laundry. I knew when we were doing our dishes. Um, and I knew that none of that mattered <laughs> because the truth of the matter is if you're not doing something, uh, about it, so to speak, then, uh, who cares? Right. So monitoring is nice. Um, gives you, uh, a lot of great information, but if you don't have the tools to do something about what you're monitoring, then, you know, it was kind of a, a moot point. Um, so. Fast forward now to 2017, October. Um, good friend of mine, um, Ron Callis, uh, worked with Blake Ricketta mm -hmm. at Lutron. And so, and you know Blake's story, but I'll, I'll make it real fast. So uh, Blake started his career at, at Lutron. He left Lutron, he went to Tesla. He left Tesla, he went to Sona, and now he's the CEO uh, um, president and CEO of Sony USA. So anyway, Blake has a passion, as he shared, I think, in the podcast for uh, our industry, the custom integration industry. And he wanted to take his energy industry battery thing and sort of get it into the custom integration industry. And in order to do that, he knew that integration was going to be one of the keys, right, to be able to make his smart battery communicate with the other devices. So his relationship with Ron, right? He calls Ron and says, Hey, Ron, who do you know in the industry that I should talk to? That's a really good software guy that can help us integrate. And Ron's like, I, I got the perfect guy. You got to call Troy. And he did. And that first conversation, um, I mean, I, I think he'll remember it and probably agree. It was, it was kind of odd. Um, he calls me and, and he's like, hey, so, um, you know, Blake, Sona, and blah, blah, blah. I make this battery thing. And uh, I just want to know if you'd be interested in making it work with your software. Why? <laughs> What's the point? A battery? What? Uh -huh. Well, the first call was, like I said, it was a little, little, little strange. But the second call that he and I had, he took a very different approach. Mm. And he touched my heart in a way that changed my life. Um he helped me understand the energy industry. He helped me understand the things that are going on, what's really happening, and, and more importantly, what's not happening. An example, no, people don't have power just because they have solar panels when the, power, when the grid goes down. What? What do you mean? No, solar's terrible for, for the grid. Huh? Why? You know, and all of a sudden, we're hours and hours into this, and I'm just blown away. And I'm going, I can solve this. Hmm. I can, I can solve these, these, these problems, you know? Yes. The grid is a big thing, but behind the meter controls, monitoring and management, once it starts to take shape can change, fundamentally change the grid. And so that was where the journey began. And, uh, he and I, uh, started spending a lot more time together, um, Ideas that he had and I had, we, we implemented them, we did them, we, we did all kinds of cool stuff. And then um, a, a, a challenge popped up that we, that, that once, I'll say it like this, once we understood all the problems, that's when we really knew nothing out there was solving it. Mm. That's how Adapt Energy really was born. Because we were doing, we were half stepping on some things in terms of maybe load shedding and things like that. But there's so much more to it. And, and once we began to understand the importance of speed, 
of communication and data and control and how that gets ahead of things for inverters and how inverters communicating with us and letting us know things matter and all this stuff. It was like amazing. And that's when we began development of Adapt Energy and we introduced uh, Adapt Energy in March of 2019. Yeah. And initially it was very much attached to Crestron, correct? But uh, that that's that's because your comfort level with that programming and um, absolutely and, and and because it's a gateway to many 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 other devices, right? And yeah. and there's so much that we can do um, with that platform. But and and uh, Crestron hardware, in my opinion, is. The best. They they just make fantastic hardware. The software is where we come in, and mm. so there's a lot of different ways to do Crestron software. As you know, uh, the software running in Adapt Energy is is built in what's called Simple Sharp Pro, and actually it's Visual Studio uh, 2022 at this point. So we're you know keeping up with things, but it the software and the hardware are very sort of they're connected, but they're very disconnected in terms of the Crestron brand. So we, we get to run our own software, I, I guess is the point. Um, but uh, because of that, it opens us up to doing other things and working with other manufacturers. And um, I mean, even, even Control 4, we've got systems out there with Adapt Energy and Control 4. You can go on Driver Central right now and download the Adapt Energy driver and you know, play with it and do stuff with it. So Lots of uh, lots has lot a lot has been done, I should say, but there's a lot more that we have on the roadmap. We will continue our conversation with Troy Morgan after the break. Do you want superior smart home automation at a great value? Shelly Wi-Fi relays by Alterco Robotics cover DC to line voltage, allowing you to control lights, outlets, appliances, garage doors, pumps, and much more. There are Shelly sensors and power measurement devices to help you measure temperature, humidity, lux, or motion, and electrical consumption from single wire to three phase with neutral. You can use Shelly with a licensed driver for Control 4, Elon, or other premium systems, as well as your customer's existing hub, voice assistant, or any platform that accepts REST, MQTT, or CoAP. Shelly can make IoT very easy. Available now at Blackwire, City Electric Supply, and Worthington, or at ShellyUSA.com. Welcome back. I'm talking with Pantech Design Founder and CEO Troy Morgan about his brand, Adapt Energy. And uh, Troy, I wanted to, to really dive in now about Adapt Energy more and talk about what it actually um, allows uh, a homeowner to do in terms of managing the energy. And uh, I, I have seen some videos that you've put on your website, which are very helpful. I listened to a podcast that you're on and I, I kind of feel like I have a good sense of it. I'm trying to figure out a way to frame the questions to, to really make it so that listeners and audience members understand what we're talking about here. So the key is really integrating the solar part and batteries, right? I mean, that's where it all starts. Um, yes, ty typically. Yes and no. Uh, what if we do it this way, Jeremy? What if we start from the end user's perspective? Okay. Right, and and the reason why is because there are uh, really two different. You could say three, but really two different end user types. So the, the ones that care about energy. And the ones that don't. Okay. All right. I mean, let, let's just be honest here. In the in the luxury space that we play in, mm -hmm. these guys are spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a month on power for their homes and whatever. But there are some that really, really care and that want to know and that and that want to be a part of helping the environment or lowering their CO2 or their carbon footprint, or, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to look at it, but there's fundamentally two different people, people mm -hmm. that, that want to know and, and, and care and people that don't, that doesn't mean the people that don't care about energy uh, stuff don't want to have resiliency to grid losses and, right. you know, things like that, you know, they they still need the same thing, but what we do for them is a little different. 
Um, so here's an example of, well, I'll say it this way. When you have those two different types of people, uh, the people that don't necessarily care about the energy stuff still have an expectation that everything's just going to work. It's going to do its job. It's going to, and, and that's what adapt energy does. It manages the loads in the home. It monitors things. It monitors how much solar production there is. It monitors how much is in, in the battery, if you will, you know, state of charge. And, and it, it works together under different circumstances to just automate everything. Okay. So right. the, the homeowner that, you know, doesn't necessarily want to see it, care about it, whatever they're, they're covered. It's all automated. Then you got the other homeowner who wants to look at everything, wants to see certain things, wants to control certain things manually. Even sometimes the people that actually recognize that, wait, I, I don't need to be running my pool right now because it's, you know, after this time or what, you know, whatever the case is, they are literally going in and they're turning things on and, oh man, there's a storm coming. Uh, I want to make sure my battery's charged. I mean, Adapt Energy does all this kind of stuff automatically, but still gives the control to the consumer uh, to not only have visibility to what's happening in the home, but also have control of what happens under different circumstances and situations. Yeah, and and I I know that the the weather, the severe weather tracking and alerts thing is a really big deal for your system. It's huge. Yeah. And that and that helps you to automate if um, I, I loved, I was listening to you talk about how, um, whether it's really about the wind, um, forecast that can be a big problem to power. Yeah. yeah and and have, and having that, having that wind, uh, warning, um, be a trigger for the automation to kick in for a system to sort of adjust, um, accordingly, uh, it was, was a really cool feature. So maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. It, it, and you're you're absolutely right. It, it's it's one of my favorite things because, again, it's all automated and I don't have to think about it. It just, you know, does what it's supposed to do. But but to to explain it, we need to understand a little bit about how uh, solar and battery uh, are used either together or even separately. Um, and then it'll make sense as to why we do certain things based on severe weather. Um, so let's take an example of um, uh, what we call daily cycling of a battery. All right. So uh, we're, we're storing sunlight. So we're taking that solar power and we're storing it in the battery. And then at night, we discharge the battery to cover uh, the load of the home for as long as, as we can. Uh, another uh, energy industry uh, phrase for that is called solar shifting or sun mm -hmm. shifting, or, you know, there's lots of names, but the point is we're, we're, we're holding on to that sun power and we're going to use it later on. Now, if we use it later on and the battery's discharging all the way down to whatever we say, maybe it's 10%, um, that's all fine and good for daily cycling because it's doing its job. What happens if there's severe weather in the area and you're sitting there depleting your battery right. when really what you should be doing is either stopping the discharge completely or even charging it depending so that you can prepare because you've now got a higher probability of a grid loss. And those probabilities are also um, uh, alert dependent probabilities, meaning if it's a uh, severe thunderstorm watch, well, you, you may or may not, right? If it's a severe thunderstorm warning, higher probability. If you have high wind, like you said earlier, Jeremy, perfect example, wind is, is, is a big one. Uh, and so wind for us even has a higher priority uh, because it's got a higher probability, right? So what it does, as soon as Adapt Energy recognizes this severe weather, it turns around, tells the battery to charge completely. Now, at the same time, we load balance because we're probably going to be charging that battery from the grid because we've got severe weather in the area. And we probably don't have a whole lot of sunlight. So since we're going to be charging the battery from the grid, we're also going to load balance. We're going to cut 
off a few things in the home. And it's all, this is all stuff that's just, you know, in the setup and can be changed at any time and whatever you want. And so, so that's one example of how Adapt Energy monitors weather and manages a home totally hands off to the end user. All that just happens. They're also, they're notified, of it, but these are just things that happen. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I know also that a, a big feature of this, and it's really important because in those early days of smart homes and uh, control systems, there was a lack of uh, control by the homeowner really in right. making adjustments. And what you've built into uh, Adapt Energy is the ability for the homeowner to make manual tweaks, as you said, for those who may be interested in the energy conservation, but also because they may want to make some priority changes to that impending storm and say, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that my priorities are, are definitely keeping the refrigerator on and the freezer on, but, um, and the lights, but beyond that, maybe decide priority on the pool pump. Do I wait a day to, to turn that on if we're going long-term outage or how do we want to do that? And, and you've created these really cool ways to make those decisions happen without having to know really the ins and outs of how the thing was programmed. It's just really, uh, I think, user-friendly looking from what I can tell. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And it's it's different strokes for different folks and circumstances <laughs> and situations change every day. And to think for a moment you can automate a person's lifestyle truly is not true. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned about automation and programming and all that is there is such a thing as over automating something. Right. Um, and so giving a, a good example is, you know, you have a grid loss and, you know, we shut down certain things that we have to shut down because we're protecting the inverter and the battery and making sure that we don't overload it and, you know, render the thing totally off. Uh, but then maybe we're shutting off a few other things that we think we should like the hot water heater, right? Um, many people don't know that that thing, uh, an electric hot water heater is a rather um, uh, heavy load. It's, you know, 4,000 watts of, of, of power requirement when it's heating. And it does, it, it's hot water heaters are crazy. They, they can retain some heat, but as things move, the heat got, drops down and then it's got to, you know, heat back up. And it, and it just does this continually. So my point is simply that if you have a grid loss, you may want to take a hot shower. We shut off the hot water heater, but hey, you want to take a hot shower? You go and you turn it back on, you take the hot shower and you turn it back off. And so it's it's kind of it's kind of cool uh, to give the end user that level of visibility and control uh, for the ones that uh, you know that that want it. Yeah, so you you typically program the system to to react to a, a potential outage um, a certain way where you you know immediately how many hours of battery you have, right? And then yeah. that's from there is when you make those individual decisions uh, as a homeowner to say uh, it, this is going to I I think this is going to be a big deal. Like let's definitely go more conservative with it and make that battery yeah. last. We um, have the initial, we have the initial decision based on the grid loss. Uh -huh. there, again, certain things we have to shut down, but moving forward, that's all feeling based. It mm. really is. How does the, the, the consumer feel about the situation? And they're getting information uh, from different places than, than the system can get, right? Mm -hmm. They, they may, maybe they got a text from their utility company. Oh, the transformer blew down the street. We'll have you back up in an hour. Well, that's a very different thing than looking outside and seeing like a black sky during the middle of the day and you're out of power and you you have no idea, right? There's a very different decision-making process that you're going to go through there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's there's all that that we're doing, but there's also just the, the, the daily living uh, trying to utilize as much solar as we possibly can. And, and I know that may sound a little funny, but you know, a lot of people like to think, oh, I'm going to put solar on my house. It's going to power my whole house and I'm going to get the 
utility company to pay me back. <laughs> well, okay, let's not get over our skis is really the deal because it's like you, you can't possibly factor in when you're designing a, uh, a a solar system for a home. First of all, that what I just described is a very, very expensive solar system. You're going to need a lot of solar because you have to account for the fact that you have nighttime. You have to account for the fact that X amount of days out of the year, you're going to have cloudy days or, you know, weather, per, you know, once you really start to dig into this stuff, you realize that, I mean, even my solar system, it generates 12,000 plus watts of power, which is actually quite good. Um, guess how much my Tesla car uses when it charges? 11,500, charges okay. at 48 amps. That's six hours at, at almost 12,000 watts. Okay. We're done here. It didn't even touch the house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, the, the point, and that's that's a probably a good segue into talking about some of the complexities and 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 things of of this blend of our two industries, right? The energy yeah. industry and, and the custom integration industry. And it's the consumers that are really driving it. Kind of like, doesn't all this work together already? Right. No, it really doesn't, but it does now because of adapt energy and and what we've already done with companies like Sonin and 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 others, Curb and and Egage and you know, there's a lot of we, we talk to a lot of energy industry companies to tie their stuff to together with our software, uh, so that we can go solve all those crazy you know projects and customer problems. Yeah, because it keeps coming up over and over again, and I had a conversation with someone in my own neighborhood and would have been the first solar. Um, installation out of 332 homes. And when I was talking to this guy who is pretty technically astute, I said, are you considering, uh, are you realizing that there's this battery component? And he had no idea. And I think he was just wow. starting the process. But as you've said in some of your other conversations, the solar companies, solar, solar panel companies don't necessarily um, pre present that up front. And a lot of consumers aren't aware that they really can't, just put panels on their house without the battery. Uh, for one thing, when the power, the grid goes out, there is no inverter operational because there's no right. power source, right? You have to have the battery just to run the inverter to go DC to AC into the home. Right. So after that, um, obviously there's the storage and there's the shifting and all of that that occurs because of the, of the battery. And just to add the intelligence of that, that's something that just doesn't, come off the shelf necessarily you know um you are so right jeremy you are so so right it's a complicated yeah, setup um, for sure um now are you ever is, but you can make it easier you, you can it, it it's um that that's another thing adapt energy does is it is it it makes it okay so back in the day i'll say you know before adapt energy and some of the other things that that, that exist maybe uh to design a system, a backup system for, for a residence, right? Um, I'll paraphrase a lot of this, but this is typically how the conversation goes. Uh, uh, solar contractor says to homeowner, you know, uh, so, oh, you want to do backup. Uh, what do you want to back up? What do you think the homeowner says? All of it. <laughs> Everything, of course. <laughs> My favorite answer too. And I respond to that answer with, no problem. We can do this. And we have done this. Uh, I'm going to need a room in your house. It's going to be about 10 foot by 10 foot at least. And we'll probably be looking at north of about a half a million. <laughs> and if you're cool with that, we can start this process now. Uh, or <laughs> uh, Adapt Energy changes the design principles with respect to how much backup power you really need, Right. So it used to be that, okay, now when you want to make that decision of, all right, well, we're only going to back up this stuff. Now you have what's called a essentials panel or a critical loads panel or a, you know, there's lots of names for that. But bottom line is a different load center behind the battery that if the grid goes down, the battery powers that stuff. Mm. That's it, right? So now we've made the decision and you're stuck with it. Right. And the other part of that is not only are you stuck with it, you don't have any control other than your manual control of 
what happens and how long the battery is going to last. That was the old way of thinking. Mm -hmm. The new way of thinking is adapt to the situation and circumstance, right? Like, so put in adapt energy and now you have this dynamic control situation and you don't have to necessarily decide up front what's going to be on, what's going to be off, those kind of things. You can make sure that you're not going to overload the inverter because we're going to, again, shut the things down that we have to so we don't overload the inverter. And then we have loads that we can kind of flex and 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 shift and adjust. Here's a, a great, great one for you. Um, Adapt Energy, we're working on some stuff right now with uh, what we like to call state of charge load shedding. So as the battery depletes, loads that have different level of priority get shut off maybe bef you know ahead of time or whatever so we get to 50% we're going to shed some more mm. all in 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 sort of favor of extending the life of okay. the battery and making the battery last as long as possible um so it's really it, it's a really different way of thinking um and the energy industry is is still in its infancy with regard to this type thinking a lot of the solar contractors they they don't want to mess with this kind of stuff because they don't understand it yet and they don't and this is where i feel like the custom integration industry is going to be able to sort of take that ball and run with it yeah now blake was mentioning big big picture stuff and he thinks that the custom integration industry can play a role but this in, this this potential is so much bigger than than our industry um, whereas you're very much focused on the industry, which I like to hear, what is it that you see? Um, obviously, he's looking at big developments, big developers, mm -hmm. and you're talking about the the wealthy homeowners that we all know and love, and is the core of our business. Um, what what do custom integrators need to understand to partner with uh, Adapt Energy and to be you know really kind of clued in on this this whole uh, solar you know, energy management sort of, uh, program. Yeah. So I look, what you've already done to get to where you are in terms of the understanding is where I think every integrator should start. And that's go to our website, uh, www.pantechdesign.com, go to the energy automation place and watch some of those videos. I promise you, you're going to learn a lot and that'll give you a good sort of foundation for, some of the things. And then from there, it's typically it's the integrators running into something on a project, right? It'll, it'll be, there'll be a solar contractor involved or a guy supplying a generator or the homeowner says, Hey, can we do battery stuff or wh whatever? And as soon as you start hearing those things, that's when you want to give me a call. You want to call us and you want to say, all right, Troy, here's, you know, here's what I know so far. And we'll help you and, and guide you through sort of the process of what questions to ask, not only of the consumer or the homeowner, but also the other trades that are involved. You know, the solar contract, we know how to speak solar contractor, right? We know how to speak electrical contractor. Solar contractor and electrical contractor are different, very, um, in, their, in their thinking. So anyway, yeah, point being, just bring us the opportunity We'll either be solving it with you by helping you through design stuff, or we're going to help you with uh, maybe some pre-sale stuff, or we're going to help you with maybe it's our product that they need, maybe not. You know, the, the thing we want to do in the industry is be the resource that you can go to for the design, the engineering, and the simple understanding of the best course of action to make all this stuff work in a way that the consumer is going to be very happy with the result and you'll end up with a successful project. So that's, that's really, that's really what it takes. You mentioned the generator. I'm curious about uh, how that fits into these systems. Is it um, supplemental in some way? Uh, when think when, when all else fails, when the battery is completely drained, you can't manage it any further. It's just a long-term outage. And then you've got the generator just for emergency backup or, is it a bad idea to even have that in a more sophisticated setup like you're talking about? Look, it, the best systems, and we have one in uh, right now in Montecito, California, that's just gorgeous, um, massive, 80 kilowatts of solar, uh, 500 kilowatt hours of battery storage, um, humongous generators, like, you know, 
the best system, you've got all your bases covered and you are, you do have battery and you do have solar and you do have generator. <laughs> and, and the idea with, with this residence is, is that it's actually a very different way of thinking. The home runs alongside the grid. It's going to get real technical real fast. So I'm <laughs> going to just leave it there. Okay. Uh, but what's, what's beautiful about it is that, um, it, it, it's all dependent on how long an outage might occur. And, you know, again, Adapt Energy does its part and, and you know, makes things happen. So uh, having a generator is not a bad thing, right? Um, now, you know, when you start really looking at CO2 and, and you know, those kind of things, yeah. natural gas generator is going to be better, but then you got to worry about, hey, you don't have control of that. Um, they can shut that down. They... Uh, and so, and then diesel, you know, there's challenges there. Generators have to be managed, mm -hmm. right? Battery, home batteries don't have to be managed at all. They, they just run forever. But generator, if you're not, you know, maintaining it properly, when it's time for that thing to be used, then, you know, it yeah. might not work. Another thing about generators, dirty power. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. So why do we want to put dirty power into our super expensive home with all this super expensive electronics and equipment and all that? Well, that's where you work with a company like Sonin and you do some pretty cool stuff with their technology. Hmm. Their batteries actually have a generator input, which okay. is super cool. See, so now you are handling things like you just talked about with that extended outage. And instead of the generator powering the home, the generator is actually charging the battery and the battery literally tells the generator what to do. Okay. So when the battery gets down to 10%, it says, Hey, generator kick on mm. generator kicks on generator charges battery and through the battery powers, the loads in the home. And then when the battery gets up to whatever, shut it down. And all that can be done directly from the adapt energy interface. That's really cool. Generators aren't, aren't a bad thing. It's, okay. it's all in how it's designed and, and, and how, how things, are, are designed to work together. And this may be a dumb question, but it, is solar always involved in the projects that you're working on? No. In fact, if solar is not being, well, look, there's, there's some areas solar just doesn't make sense. Um, some of it's geographical stuff. Some of it's other things, uh, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> Some of the regulations and things out there relative to cities and, and states and county, it, it gets interesting. Um, but yeah, no, we have plenty of projects that are battery only. Okay. And the reason why is because, well, A, you can, but B, you know, think about that sort of shifting of the sun. Well, you might have a peak time and an off peak time from your utility where you're paying more for peak time than off peak time. But if you could, buy power during off peak mm -hmm. charge battery and discharge during peak time we call that time of use or tou um then you're you're really uh helping yourself uh, in terms of your pocketbook right? right so we do have systems that are that are doing that so that's a different type of daily cycling mm -hmm. rather than using storing the sunlight right we're we're just sort of storing cheaper power using it later and then you got to wrap that up into, you know, grid loss things that can happen and being ready, you know, backup wise and, and things like that. So, you know, we getting into the, the project level stuff where you're looking at a home and what you need to do in the home power wise and all that. We love, we love getting into that, but we also have a lot of fun with the big, big stuff. And we are working on, on something, uh, super exciting. Um, I can't get into it too much, but I can share that it's the largest uh, ski resort to ever be built in the United States. Mm. And um, uh, Adapt Energy is going to be pretty much the heart of the energy systems in all the homes in the resort and those kind of things. And they're going to do it all, right? Mm. Solar, battery, generator, you name it. Um, and it. And they and they all, they have time of use, but they're going to be doing daily cycling, and they're going to be all prepared for whatever happens because of Adapt Energy and you know what it does. So that's Exciting basically 
they're they're basically making the the resort for the apocalypse. So, so everybody just goes there to ski it out at the end and live guess, as long man. as possible yeah. for heat. <laughs> yeah, totally. I never thought about it like that, but maybe I need to get a place up there. I don't know if I can afford it though. Trust me, they're 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 pretty pretty awesome luxury kind of places. And so yeah, it's um, look, it's exciting. This this I, I think I heard Blake use the words. Two trillion dollar industry uh, in in his podcast, and in terms of the energy transition, um, I'm gonna I want to share one thing, uh, and I know we're probably getting close to our time here, but I believe yeah. this is important, and I want people to hear it from me. Um, my heart is set on achieving a complete flip of how we use and think about power in the United States. Here's what that means. Today, primarily, the grid is the source of power. People put solar on, batteries, and all that. Man, still, just like I said earlier, like, you know, you need a lot more solar than you think, uh, typically, Mm -hmm. right? But so you're not going to solve it all just by putting on solar panels and whatnot. But um, I believe that uh, instead of doing it that way, well, I'll say it like this. The grid's the primary, and then your little things you're doing in your house are, are secondary. I think that needs to be flipped, and I think the home needs to be the primary source of power, right? Combination of solar, battery, and management. You, you put all, all of those together, and you're making very smart decisions about what to do under different circumstances and situations. Uh, Case in point, we have excess solar. Well, is the battery full? Yeah. Okay. Turn on the pool pump. Let that run for a little bit. Are we still in that same position? Yeah. Shut down the pool pump. Kick on the hot water heater. You know, these are real things that that, that can happen. And the I also believe the community becomes the secondary source. What I mean by the community is behind behind the transformer Mm -hmm. or transformers, depending. I think the, that uh, master plan communities need to have foresight into some type of solar farm and some type of large battery storage. Those things are becoming more and more available every day. And then we turn the grid into the last resort. Mm-hmm. You do that, you're going to take the strain off the grid and uh, it just it changes everything. And that's what we're really trying to do is 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 create the intelligence that's going to allow behind the meter controls to be so good that we can flip the script and do it the way I just described. Well, Troy, I I know I've got so many more questions that I could go to, but I I, I think we'll leave that for another conversation. That's a great way to finish um, and a, a very optimistic tone. I hope that we can get there. And I think that uh, what you're doing with Adapt Energy is is definitely a step, step in the right direction. And I hope it's very successful for you and you have a great uh, rest of the year. Um, thanks so thanks, much for buddy. taking the time out. <laughs> great talking thanks. to you. Likewise. Troy Morgan is founder and CEO of Pantech Design and Adapt Energy. You can learn more about his company at pantechdesign.com. That wraps up today's show. Special thanks to Pretty Easy Podcast for producing this episode. If you're new to Residential Tech Talks, please subscribe to the weekly podcast on your preferred platform and consider rating or reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Also, check out all the latest residential tech news at the magazine's website, restechtoday.com, where you can also subscribe to the print or digital magazine and to our Tuesday and Friday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell. Residential tech talks, lighting specialist, architect, and that's how you're going to be.